Thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity. So what does a forester have to say about finance? There's a long tradition in forestry to work on long-term on long investments, but it's, of course, the attention on red that has captured our new interest in investments. We all know that we're expecting private finance to come in and pay for a lot of those emission reductions that we expect to happen. But as we have worked with RED, we quickly realized two things. One is that this will not happen in the forest alone. We have to work together with agriculture to make it possible. And secondly, this will not work with climate finance alone. We have to work with land use more holistically. And that, that has taken us into looking at a landscape approach to financing uh, sustainable land use. And Landscapes look very different. This is a famous painting from Finland, 1893. Could have been my home country, Sweden. It looked like this in many parts, people eking out a living from, from the land. But landscapes still look in a similar way. This is a landscape from South America, and it's today. So we, we see the challenges remain, and, and we have to figure out new ways to move towards sustainable landscapes. This is what happened in my home country. Obviously, a lot of investments, a lot of development, and it's a, an interesting example of that it is possible to move in the right direction. Landscapes look very different. So how can we find ways to standardize approaches to sustainable landscapes? This is what I'm going to talk about today. And what is it that we need to make this work? I propose that we need to understand the basic objectives for sustainable landscapes and how we measure progress at a reasonable cost. I propose that we need, understand, need to understand the return opportunities from landscapes and the associated risks. We heard a lot about this in the previous panel. We need to have a commitment from the public sector to implement the rule of law and support governance, risk management, and research. And that needs to be smart support, not the kind of subsidies that we heard a lot about in the previous section. We also need to accept that farmers and producers are in charge. It is their priorities, their investments, their risk taking that will decide whether we go towards sustainable development or not. And finally, we need to figure out financing that benefits both the large scale investors and the small scale producers. And that needs to take all of the above into account. I'm going to make three propositions to you in this presentation. The first one is that we can define a sustainable landscape, and we need to keep it simple. I propose that a sustainable landscape has four objectives. And this is so simple, I could explain it to my 11-year-old son. And he would get it, and he would like it. We need to provide for livelihoods. We need to sustain eco ecosystem services. We need to deliver food and non-food products. And we need to keep pollution down and resource efficiency up. This is a package that can be applied to any landscape of any size anywhere. It can be a farm, it can be a country, it can be a continent, it can be a dry ecosystem, it can be a human ecosystem. If we take that one step further, we can define measures that work pretty much in any location. They're not perfect, but we can at least say that we have a rough idea of what we mean by performance of a sustainable landscape. And um, I won't go more in detail because I don't have time, but the important properties of these measures is that, of course, they are measurable, they're easy to understand, they need to be as easy as GDP to understand. Um, and they need to be relevant to sustainable development, to climate change, to food security, and, this is the point, investment in green growth. Unless we embrace all of these mega objectives, we will have difficulties to explain what we want and implement it. And I'm suggesting that if, if all these four measures are stable or improving, then we could say that we have a sustainable landscape. And it's important here that I'm proposing a relative measure, not an absolute measure. We can spend ages defining targets and levels and baselines. I think it is smarter to take a relative approach to 
to how we look at the sustainable landscape. This was my first proposition. My second proposition is that investments in sustainable landscapes can contribute dramatically to meeting development goals, broader development goals. And on this, I want to give three perspectives. First, from an investor perspective. This is not my perspective. I'm not an investor, but I'm talking to people who are managing or helping to manage very large-scale funds, international equity funds, pension funds. They say that there is a mountain of finance waiting to be waiting for good investment propositions that also contribute to sustainable development. We hear often in, in the news that pension funds are withdrawing from investments, for example, in oil palm plantations, because they don't consider them sustainable enough for, their, for their, the conditions that they operate under. Secondly, farmers and producers say, I'm not a farmer, I'm not a producer, but they say that access to long-term, affordable, and reliable capital is a major limiting factor for our enterprises. I think that is universally valid. And then thirdly, the public sector has the desire to use their public funds to steer investments to generate public goods and sustainable development. Well, that's the red thing, and many other things too, biodiversity and other uh, sustainable development uh, uh, issues. So why, doesn't these, why don't these three things come together? Well, we have some perceptions that hinder us. We often hear that land use profits are bad for the environment because it means intensification of agriculture and deforestation, all, all sorts of things. We hear that land use profits are bad for local people because agribusiness will take over. We hear that farmers are always farmers, but the de demographics of the world is changing. Farmers have different incomes. They have families in the cities. Most, there are still very many poor farmers in many parts of the world, and those, of course, need a lot of attention. But most of land use, most of agriculture, most of production is done by people who are increasingly not poor. Food prices must be kept down. Um, I dare to say that this paradigm is perhaps good politically, perhaps good for the poorest of the poor, but it's definitely good, not good for sustainable landscapes. And then how can we feed the world? We'll, we're always, we always see as, as uh, today and yesterday, as there's a big conference in Dublin on food security, the message that's been sent out in major media is that we will need more food produced, otherwise we will have millions die of starvation in 2050. This kind of message doesn't really help when we talk about the investments and livelihoods of, of uh, the farmers and producers. And then finally, the sectors. The sectors are silos. We can't continue to operate in these silos. They will not be able to find the solutions. But there are also some ideas that help. Green growth with equity is the paradigm of today. This is something we can build on. The climate change Pursuit, adaptation, and mitigation is something that is useful, even if the finances may not be sufficient in themselves. It's a good, it's a good lever. Trade, if we accept the notion of trade, um, we will have a better starting point. And finally, the ethical considerations in large-scale investments are picking up and will help us uh, in what we want to achieve. My third proposition is that this is actually possible. Um, but it requires scale. Um, this is a bit of a complicated graph. I'm not going to explain it in detail. But there are two things to say here. One is that there is no doubt that investing in land use, investing in agriculture, investing in forestry can be profitable. This is a proposition that investments actually, sorry, investors actually think is a good proposition. And they don't have to change their DNA, as was suggested in the previous session. They can make money. And they can make money even if there are sustainability conditions put on this, these investments. The problem is the risk management. And risks occur because we have, uh, because 
by and large because we are not able to distribute the risk across uncorrelated events. If we only look at investments in one crop, we will always have disasters happen at the same time and we have big defaults and we will have problems for the investors. If we only look at investments in one country, same thing. Um, if we only look at investments in a particular market, we may also risk that the, there are defaults of a scale that investors don't like very much. But if we look at a portfolio across all these, across farming systems, land use systems, forestry systems, across countries and continents, and across different markets, we will find, and this is what this figure shows, we will find that the, the risks are actually quite uncorrelated. So with a broader portfolio, the investors will like the picture because they find a portfolio which is, has an uncorrelated set of risks which they can manage, which brings down the, the cost, the, the transaction cost of the investment. That's good. This is not my field, but this is what I'm being explained. This is my field. Um, if we accept what I said before about what, what is a sustainable landscape and, and how do we measure performance of that sustainable landscape, then we know that we can design monitoring systems, verification systems at an aggregated level that assures the investors and the wider public that we're actually going in the right direction overall. We will never be able to control every single farmer. That would be too costly. What we need to do is to keep the transaction costs down. We need to keep the cost of verification down. And that can be done if we accept some form of common definition of what a sustainable landscape is. And then finally, it is, this is possible, but we need to make sure that public funds are used effectively. They need to be used to strengthen governance framework, strengthen the rule of law, to, in, to put resources, make resources available in protection funds. Because even if we design a portfolio, a verification system, there will still be residual risks that need to be picked up by someone. And this might be a very efficient use of public funds rather than trying to operationalize public funds through subsidies to every farmer. Um, we also think that piloting models like the one we are describing uh, is useful, is useful, is to make good use of public funds. And of course, public funds need to be used for, to research these opportunities even more. Finally, what next? C4 with partners including ECRAF, the Munden Project, at the Neo School of Government and Chatham House, continue to work on the research and development of these ideas. Uh, we are reaching out to other partners, specialists in the finance sector, in the landscape sectors, and uh, many others. And this is quite exciting. It is triggered by red, but it has grown to become a much more complete uh, idea of investing in sustainable landscapes. And we hope to provide more findings, more concrete findings through, uh, throughout this year. And perhaps next year we can come down to some piloting of this approach. That's what I wanted to say. This is finally a picture of C4, the forestry institution now engaged in finance and investments at the landscape level, which is a little bit new, but we feel that we are on the right track. We are working across the tropics, and our vision is that forests and landscapes are on the political agenda, that their values are recognized, and that the decisions that are made benefit forests and people. Thank you. They are. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. I know that the, the, the tagline at the bottom of your slides, I'm not sure if everyone can read it, is uh, thinking beyond the canopy. Uh, and I think that's very, very much what we heard um, today. So thank you very much indeed to Peter. Um, we're now going to break for 20 minutes um, to have coffee. Uh, it's been a pretty marathon morning. Um, so if we could meet um, back here at uh, 5 to midday at the very, very latest, because we will get started exactly then. Thank you.